Hi, welcome everybody to the Beginner Rider Course private Facebook group. My co-facilitator, Lovey, who's in the course, and I, we are gonna talk to you guys about the equipment. Now I know that you have a bunch of bonus materials in on the course, and one of them is all about um, saddle fitting and bareback fitting, and then we have transitioning into bitless. We have that video, which was made, I think, seven years ago, and I've narrowed down since then. I only really use a few pieces of bitless apparatus, equipment. I still use the same bareback pad, so I'm going to go through all of that with you because there's a lot of myths and misunderstandings about bitless and bareback. Number one, in my experience, with working with thousands of horses and students over the years, and every horse has been introduced to bitless, they've been developed, trained, retrained that way, um, rehabilitated that way, specifically with a rope halter that I'm going to show you, and they have all been started with a bareback pad. The number one reason why the bareback pad is so effective and perfect, absolutely perfect, is I've never had a sore back on a horse, ever. Number one, isn't that what we're all concerned about? Is our horse's back, more than our own safety, feeling safe in a saddle. It's really how does, and it should be this way, how does the saddle or the pad fit the horse's back? Because the worst thing we want is pain, to cause our horses pain. And, you know, when a horse is in pain, that's when bucking happens, that's when accidents happen, that's when the horse can't perform and go through the movement that we're asking them to, not to mention we see saddle sores, white hairs, and often horses have rotated scapula and hollow backs. And rotated scapula are because the saddle is up too high. And so the scapula is right here on Lovey. This is your scapula. It's right here on Lovey, and if you notice, it's flat. With a lot of older horses, and Lovey's 11, but I've had Lovey since she, um, I rescued her from the racetrack. She never did race, but she did have a year or two of training. So she was three when I got her. So she's nice and flat. Most horses have a big bulge here, and the big bulge is scar tissue, because that's a muscle. And so if Lovey's moving and she's got her front leg out, I'm stretching it right now, just look how far back that muscle goes. It goes way back here. And what happens often, my fingers right here, is the saddles are put way up here on top of the wither. And that means that, come here, love. That means that you're now, your leg is right on top of that muscle, the gullet, which does not move. It's a hard piece. It's supposed to fit over the wither area and the shoulder. That's probably one of the hardest places to fit for a horse, not to mention the proper tree width, but the gullet now is tight. And so her muscle went all the way back here. And now you're riding on that muscle, the saddle pressure and your pressure, your leg pressure. And so what happens is the horse, it's like you trying to move your shoulder and you can't, you can't move it. And so just think of how that's gonna affect your movement and the rest of your body conformation and how you carry yourself. And this is the number one thing I see wrong with saddle fitting, period. And education on where to place the saddle. So I get into all of that in your bonus course. I'm not gonna take up time talking more about it except supporting why I choose a bareback pad. There's so many pros and there are no cons. There's all pros. <clears throat> the only con might be that you guys don't feel safe or secure because you don't have a saddle horn or a deep seat in your English or dressage saddle or fenders or knee rolls or whatever apparatus is on your saddle to keep you in place something to hang on to. <clears throat> so this bareback pad, 
is the one that I recommend. I've tried so many of them. And I talk about this pad and why I recommend it in the bonus course. <clears throat> I just wanted to go over some of the equipment quickly for you guys as a welcome introduction. And this pad, of course, is flexible and that's why it sits far up on her withers. It's designed to sit way up here, not like a saddle. Saddle should sit back here. And as you can see, this leather piece is going to fit kind of towards the bottom of her wither so that it has a nice incline or decline here, which is gonna put you back on your balance point versus if the pad was here, you'd be sitting on this leather, it would be really uncomfortable and you would be throwing your, your body forward. So there is a purpose to how you position the bareback pad. Very important for you. Your legs should be right about here. <clears throat> now I only use three types of bitless bridles, so to speak, equipment these days. And there are more bitless bridles. There's plenty of them out there that are really, really good. The biggest point I want to make is you want to use something, anything that either just has a nose band and either attaches the reins at the bottom or you could even attach the reins here. Okay, that's fine. What I don't want to see are side pulls like Dr. Cook's bridle. Side pulls, it's where you have leather that crisscrosses underneath of the chin and comes out the sides and then you attach the reins. One of the worst things with side pulls is they do not relax. They don't give. And so the horse feels constant pressure, even if it's a light pressure. I've had plenty of horses that I've rehabilitated that could not stand the side pull. And their current, their owners were riding in bitless bridles thinking that they were being humane and, and gentle. <clears throat> but the horses were snatching and evading and avoiding contact and getting themselves really worked up because of the constant pressure, not to mention with side pulls, if you pull really hard, you can actually push the horse's jaw and their tongue and you can just squeeze everything together from the hundreds of nerve endings that they have, their delicate noses, hundreds of nerve endings. You have to be so careful with what you use. And then you're pushing all of their, their bottom of their chin you're just squishing it and pushing it. And horses have been known to get ulcers and lacerations inside their mouths, specifically from side pulls. So as you can see, this is really loose. Um, unfortunately, the manufacturer of this head stall, bitless head stall, they don't make these anymore. Um, but this is a really soft rope material with just two knots to keep it even. Lots of room underneath, the reins attach. I could attach reins here if I wanted but I prefer down here because the tension is on the pull, on the pole, excuse me. The tension is on the pole, not on the nose. So for those of us that wanna keep the nose pretty sensitive, cause there's lots of nerve endings, there's a big reason why we need to teach our horses the in-hand work um, and get them really used to giving and feeling trusting and safe with that type of pressure around their face. So I always start horses out with a nice, soft, marine quality um, halter, real soft, just two normal knots, not a bunch of knots. Again, I'm very aware of their nerves on their nose. And this would be a 12 foot lead rope. And I'll show you how I fasten that. And I have worked horses all the way up to third, fourth level dressage. Done reining, done everything with just a rope halter. You might be asking, how is that possible? Because I develop all of my horse's movement on the ground first, and I develop the movement that I want to ride before I ride it, including tempi lead changes, flying changes, and the pee off. They learn all of that on the ground first. That would be in my mastery membership program. That's the big course. So you really don't need to be hanging on your horse's face and you shouldn't. When you develop your horse properly and you develop self carriage, that means the horse can carry themselves and they're not relying on you to hold them up. 
So I, while I follow classical dressage principles, um, that's where I stop. There, you do not need to be kicking and pumping your horse with your legs to get them to open up their top line. They will learn that naturally in my lunging methods. And they will also learn self-carriage, so you don't have to hold them. You don't have to work on contact at all. Your horse will not be afraid of contact, but they will be able to carry themselves and everything will just work out naturally. It's really cool. So I go through how to tie this. Pretty simple. And this is how you're gonna end up making a rein. And there you go. Now you've got your reins. Pretty simple. And again, I'm all about this type of um, connection, the reins to the headstall instead of laterally. I like it vertically because I'm all about the pull. And horse has two points of restriction in their top line where they tighten. One is the pole and the second is the wither, the shoulder area. So this is why we really want them to open up their resistance when they get imbalanced. As we develop their balance, then they will maintain an open top line, but there will be points where you're going to have to help them. And so that's why this type of contact is most important versus the nose. I don't want to be pulling on the nose that much. She's going to feel it here first before she feels it here. And the third bridle is custom made for my big 18 hand Frisian sport horse, Zor. <clears throat> so this is made in Ireland and um, has a beautiful um, hand embroidered Celtic symbolism for the Dow of Horsemanship and also what Zor's name um, symbolizes, which is courage. And so this is just really nice. And again, it's bitless and the reins attach on the side, has a chin strap that is really a nose piece. It's all one piece. It's very loose on him. Um, and like I said, in the beginning, uh, when I'm working with horses and developing them, I always just use a rope halter. Zor's um, a schoolmaster now, so the, he's so responsive to contact. And while he may be really out of shape, he's very well balanced. So he immediately relaxes his top frame when he feels contact laterally versus underneath. Lovey's a schoolmaster too. She doesn't have a problem with that either. <clears throat> so again, the, one of the big reasons why I promote the bareback pad is because of the horse, number one, and how safe it is. I have never had a sore back on a horse. This pad is very thick, as you can see. It comes in neoprene or wool. I think both are great. And it has leather. You never want nylon. Nylon slides. You want leather. It grips and it conforms. This will be very stiff when you get it, and then it will naturally conform to you and your horse. This is Lovey's bareback pad. It doesn't, I don't ride. I have a bareback pad for each of my horses. So your horse is still going to feel your sit bones, your seat bones. You have a left one and a right one, um, right on each side of your, your crotch, basically. So she's still going to feel them to a point. Um, and that's why I don't recommend riding truly bareback because your horse is going to feel your sit bones. You can create a sore back, not to mention you can slide all over the place. You get really dirty and we're here to develop your confidence and your balance point. So I don't need you guys riding bareback and sliding all over the place and worrying about that. Um, this is suede. They all come in suede and in many different colors. And the suede is what helps you stick. It's fantastic. And the way I'm teaching you to ride, you're not riding with your legs. So you're not squeezing the horse to go and you're not squeezing to hang on. You're truly learning through your balance points. And there's several of them. It's not just your seat, but also your core, how to ride, how to create an independent, balanced seat, independent and balanced, independent of your hands and your legs, using them for balancing. So this is just excellent. One of the things I want to point out quickly, without going into too much detail about saddles, is you, every horse's body is unique to them just like our body is unique. And 
I could wear Sabrina, my camera lady, and your, uh, my co-host with you guys. You're going to get to know Sabrina on the Facebook group. I could wear, we could be the same size shoe, but our shoes don't necessarily fit us the same way because of the way we walk. Okay? You know, it's everything from our own personal body conformation. Maybe I'm stronger, weaker on one side. Maybe I'm shorter on one side. Um, maybe I'm heavier than Sabrina. So even though we might be the same size shoe, it doesn't mean that shoe is going to work for both of us. And it's the same principle for saddles. And when you're fitting a saddle, there's so many things that need to be taken into consideration. Um, and one of the first things I want to bring up is you've got the spine here, then you have tendons, a tendon on each side of the spine, and then you have muscle. And when you fit a saddle, the saddle must, the tree, be wide enough to sit on the muscle, not the tendon, the muscle. So if Sabrina wants to come up here with the camera and take a look at Lovey's back. Hey, gorgeous. You just step on up there, my dear. Lovey's a thoroughbred, pure, pure thoroughbred, pure bred for racing. She's got a really awesome conformation. She's got a high wither, as you guys can see, nice slope. But look how nice and wide her back is. She has a really nice back. Here's her spine. That's her spine. Her tendons are right here. Here's her muscle. And if you looked at the anatomy of a horse, an illustration, you would see this more clearly. So. If your tree of your saddle has got to be wide enough to sit and balance your weight over here, most of the time, I've, every student that's brought me their saddle that has not been custom fit, it has sat on the horse's tendons. That is horrifying. Not to mention it doesn't fit the wither. Every horse's wither is going to be different. And so you've got to have space for that gullet, for the whole saddle to give this horse plenty of room because of her high wither, her big shoulder. She's built like a warm blood up here and she moves like one. She's got a short back. That's another technicality. Short back, look at that. Look at her back, really. It's right here, that's it. These are all the things you have to take into consideration. And a saddle should never fit beyond the last rib. And a horse's last rib is right about here. It's crazy when you think about it. That's why I said her back is right here, you guys. If you get beyond her last rib, you're starting to sit on her kidneys. And so if you're even in an English saddle and it's sitting too far back, it's dispersing your weight back here. And this is where you can start to create lumbar issues, a roach back, a roach back, lumbar issues, SI issues back here. Not to mention you might get bucking and inability for your horse to pick up the right lead because it happens back here in the hind end, but everything is going to affect everything. You never have to worry about that with the right bareback pad. <laughs> you never have to worry about that, ever. And so most people can't afford a three to $5,000 custom fit saddle, and that's an average cost. It can go higher, it shouldn't go any lower than three. So I just wanted to give you guys an introduction um, to the bareback and the bitless and why I chose both. Um, I would never want a bit in my horse's mouth again after what I've learned, ever. And most of my learning is studying the great masters, starting with Xenophon, the art of horsemanship from 300, 400 AD. Okay, he was the first, he designed dressage and he was the first to work without a bit. In today's modern dressage, it's still historical and classical, but it is one of the truest classical dressage forms that exists today, and that's the Spanish school of riding. So if you study the history in Spanish school of riding, it takes eight years to develop a horse. 
and you develop all of the movement before you ever ride it. The bit is never introduced until the very end. And the whole purpose of the bit, the history of the bit, was to open up resistance in the pole or shoulder. That's it. So that's why you see in the upper level dressage, um, pre-St. George, Grand Prix, fourth level, you see riders with a double bridle. They have both a curb bit and a snaffle. And those were the two original bits designed and each had a specific reason or purpose. One was to break open the resistance at the pole and one was to break open the resistance in the wither shoulder area. And so what happens when a horse loses their balance, they go here. And then they create that lock, that resistance right here that travels and locks up the rest of their body. It makes the horse tight, they brace. And so the bit was to open the horse's top line back up and rebalance them, help them rebalance themselves. That's it, that's it, that's it. So why do we even need a bit? We don't, we don't need a bit. If you're worried about getting your horse under control and feeling safe with your horse, then I recommend starting on the ground and developing the relationship and the mindset, the, your horse's ability to self-regulate themselves so they don't implode or explode. We don't offer that in the beginner rider course. It solely focuses on riding and it dives in deep and teaches you how to ride, truly ride with an independent, balanced, secure, confident seat. During that process, you're working on everything that you need to, to get your horse to transition into bitless and become very light and responsive to your aids, both riding and your contact. So that's just an intro to what you guys are gonna be exploring and learning. And I look forward to doing our monthly webinars where I can dive in deep and explain things further with all of you as a group. And I certainly look forward to any questions you might have via the Facebook group or emailing me privately, directly. Thank you, and I'll see you guys soon.